Welcome everyone to Watch Your Story. I'm your host, Emmanuel Mutui. It has been a while since we've done this, so I'm just grateful for everyone tuning in right now to watch this show. And this episode today is special. We've, we have had a lot of trial and error, and I believe this is the one that God has ordained to make it public. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Leo Goes. What's up, man? I'm glad to be here. I'm happy that you're here. <laughs> and thank you for being patient with us. We've definitely learned a lot, and I can't wait for people to hear your story. Absolutely. And so we'll just jump to the beginning. Okay. Where are you from, Mr. Leo? Born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. Okay. And when, when, when you're in Hawaii, what was the, the vibe there? Like your family, were you tied with your family? Were you close with your family? Yeah, so a very large family. I'm the baby of eight kids. Mm -hmm. Um. And growing up in the in the mid '60s, early '70s was a great, just a great time to be a kid. Mm -hmm. um, we we just played uh, from sun sunrise to sunset outside. You know, there was no video games, no cell phones, no other distractions. So we were uh, we just had an amazing childhood uh, where we grew up in in Hawaii. So, which obviously is a very different time than now. Yeah, when very you, much so. When you were growing up, what, what, what did you want to be as an adult? I didn't really know. So my, I have four older brothers, all that excelled at sports from a very young age. And so here I was, the fifth boy, um, but I was very tall, but very awkward and very clumsy as a young kid. So my older brothers would kid and they were like, I don't know about this one. <laughs> So early on, early on was rough for me. It was mainly because I was growing so much so fast. And then um, once I hit high school, everything changed. Everything flipped oh, yeah? on what itself. Happened? That's when my, I think my body and my kind of mind kind of synced together. And that's where I just, the guys that were dominating me when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, I was, I was smashing when, when I was in high school. Really? Yeah, no, no, because I'd I'd grown so much. I was already six, about my height now, six four at, as a freshman. So once, once I hit high school, yeah, everything athletically changed for me in a positive way. What was the sport that you were drawn to at that time? In high school? Yes. Uh, in high school, I was so I, I started playing football from from uh, seventh and eighth grade, but. Um, it was rough. Those those two years was was rough, but everything, again, like I said, changed uh, once I got into high school. And, and football clearly became the sport that I wanted to pursue. Oh yeah. Um, and not knowing the opportunities it would have for me down the road, but I just, I loved. I, what, I grew to love the sport. What was it about football that just drew you? Um. So in high school, I uh, I was a tight end. Okay. So I got I got a chance to catch the ball, and I was already like I said as a freshman I was you know about about six four maybe six three, um, so I was a pretty big guy, um, and so I loved just running over guys after I caught the ball, and I also loved on on running plays going down and just going after um, either linebackers or defensive backs and just mm -hmm. putting them on the ground. I really loved that part of it, so. Yeah, so all throughout my high school years, I played played uh, tight end, and then I also played uh, uh, high school basketball. Okay, so playing as a tight end football player, what was if you had to summarize your high school career? What would you say is probably your best moment on the field? Uh, I had a few of them. Um, so I, I, I was able to make the varsity team as a sophomore. I was one of the two, two or three guys that did in our, in our class. And I got thrown in, actually ended up beating out a senior as a sophomore. Uh, he wasn't too happy about it, but um, that's how it, I, I ended up being the guy as a sophomore. So what I really liked, I really liked, because uh, in our system, they wouldn't throw the ball a whole lot to me. They would only do it maybe two or three times a game, if that. And so I knew I had to make the most of it. So there were a couple of times where just a little dunk pass over the middle, they'd give it to me. And a couple of times I was able to take it all the way to the house. 
really? uh, either running over guys or running running by them. Okay. And so those were those were real memorable moments uh, okay. in so you, in high school. You love that physical. Concept. Oh yeah, I loved it. Oh wow. But that all came from my dad. My dad, um, being the matri uh, patriarch of our family, and very involved with me and my older brothers when when it came to sports. You know, he was at every practice, wow. uh, let alone every game. He was he set the bar high, and um, encouraged us, uh, and. So, um, made sure that we played up to that standard. Not he didn't lower the standard. He he expected um, us to give it everything we had. Wow, which has definitely shaped you to be the man that you are on the field. Yeah, it took now. it took me a while. My older brother, right above me, had it kind of instinctively. He was a really aggressive guy. Me, I that kind of grew as I grew older, and I started to get stronger and bigger. Uh, once I hit you know junior senior in high school, I was well on my way. That's when all the offers started coming from colleges, mm -hmm. and so um, I, I could I, I started seeing fruit from the yeah. all the hard work I had put in uh, leading up to that. So that's your success on the field. What about off the field? In high school? Off the field, I was a wild man. Um, I uh, was a party animal. Uh, you know, I was a well-known guy on campus. I was into girls. Uh, I was just doing my thing. I was I was basically an idiot in high school in, in that respect. Yes. I didn't have I didn't have the Lord in my life. Um, we were raised Catholic, but we rarely even attended Catholic mass. It was like just on the holidays. It was just, just wasn't a big thing in our family. Um, so yeah, I, I made a lot of poor choices off yeah. the field mm -hmm. because of that, and. Um, you know, but that's part of that was part of my story. Part of my testimony was yeah. was those years were crazy. It was nothing but sports and girls, uh, and, girls and then school. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, school at the bottom. School was definitely at the bottom. <laughs> so when do you meet your wife then? So I met I met Kathy, my wife now of going to be well just made thirty six years. Um, we met our going into our senior year in high school. Mm -hmm. We met at our campus. She was a cheerleader for. Our big rival school, uh, the school that we hated the most, she was a cheerleader for. Wow! So uh, we met at our campus. There were ho our campus, our um, school was hosting our huge statewide cheerleading camp. So there were cheerleaders all over campus for the for this week, and um, we were just in the tail end of our football camp, and so that's where we that's where we met. And then a few days later, I remember we had a, a dance at our campus in the wrestling room, and we ended up, uh, you know, hooking up that night, dancing a lot, having fun, and then going out afterwards with my friends and her friends. So that's when we 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 kind of officially started dating. Yeah. And how did she, how did meeting her, turn your wild self down? Um, no, they didn't do it initially. Um, I was still my wild self all throughout high school. Um, it really didn't, even though I had exposure, I had exposure to the gospel and to Christ and my older brother, um, uh, seven years older than me, he led a large Bible study um, while I was in high school, which every now and then I would attend. So I had exposure to it. I just wanted, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want anything to do with it yeah. at that time in my life. So I know you got say, born again in college. What was that encounter like? So that was my, um, so that same kind of lifestyle kind of ran all the way through college as well, where uh, although I, I was married, I got married my sophomore year in college, Kathy and I got married in 1987, there was still no Jesus in the middle of it. Yeah. So our marriage for those first couple of years was, was pretty shaky. You know, I was I was doing well in sports, in football, kind of. I was just, in a nutshell, a real selfish guy, and um, I didn't treat. I didn't know how to treat her the way she needed to be treated. I was just all about, you know, making sure I was good. And so, our salvation story is is pretty awesome. So right after my senior year, which I had a great senior year, I you know I was getting a lot of attention from the NFL already even early on in my senior year. Um, so, so much so that I was the only guy who went to the scouting combine 
of our of our whole team, which is an invite by the NFL to go to Indianapolis and, and compete in that. And so I did really well in that. I had a great all-star game in the Hula Bowl. So my stock as a player was just going like this, straight up the roof uh, to the ceiling. And um, so a month before the draft, I get a call from my brother, the same brother that was um, uh, had a strong faith in the Lord all throughout those crazy years in high school for me and now I'm in college um he this his pastor calls me uh over a, a puppy dog a black lab that he had bought and and wanted me because I'd raised he he knew that I raised German shepherd dogs in college so we ended up spending the whole day with him I did then my wife and I have dinner with he and his wife we had a big barbecue and then at their house in their living room is when he started asking, we're just sitting down just like this, and he's asking us, hey, you know, how are things going? He already knew about all the football stuff because I was on the news a lot. They were tracking how I was doing. The draft was, you know, only a few weeks away. Um, but he started asking real personal questions about our marriage, about, you know, what's our plans. And um, it was evident to him by our responses that um, we, there was no Jesus in, in our life. So the whole conversation did a, er, and then he kind of brought it back to the gospel yeah. and led us through in a, in a very concise, clear way in, uh, in, a, in a matter of 15, 20 minutes, what that all means. And we were, Kathy and I were both looking at each other and like, wow, this is exactly what we're missing as a couple. And even for me as an athlete, both of us as just, individuals so we on uh, March the 3rd 1990 um, repented of all the craziness that we had gone through up to that point and gave everything my future career and everything over to to the Lord and, it, and it accepted him as my Lord and Savior and that was a it was a radical a radical change for me Wow, uh, awesome. where I was meeting with him every day because he knew after the draft if I got drafted high I would probably be gone and which ended up happening. So we would meet every day. He would just, he was giving me a, just a foundation and a spiritual foundation in which to stand on, um, just kind of walk me through the Bible in, in general themes of parts of the Bible. Wow. So let's get back to your football side of things. So high, you, you're singing in high school. What made you choose to go to how, is it University of Hawaii? Yeah, University of Hawaii. Um, yeah, so I had a lot of offers. I had offers to go to some really big schools and it really, Emmanuel came down to a five minute conversation I had with my dad. It was really simple. My dad was a really simple minded guy. And his question was simply this, whether you make it to the NFL or not, where do you see home being? Is it in the mainland or is it here in Hawaii? Which at that time, I had no idea. I had, no, I couldn't even fathom the NFL as as a high school guy. I, I told him, "Yeah, it's here. I'm, I'm want to live here in Hawaii." So he used that to use that older brother as an example how he went through the University of Hawaii, and his name in the community was like gold, yeah, because everybody knew him from what he did on the field, and that translated to. Um, the job that he, the what career that he has now as a financial guy. He walked right into that, right out of college. And so that was really the conversation I had with my dad, made sense to me um, because he, he, and he also said to that, that, that the people of Hawaii, which is very, very true, they never forgot or never forget the, the local players who stay home and play, but they easily forget the ones that go away and play on the mainland. You're gone for a couple of years and they, yeah. don't, they, they forget about you. Okay. But the guys that play at University of Hawaii, they never forget. And that's really true. Even when I go home now as a 50, mid, in my mid 50s, all the older guys that I run into all want to talk about my days at UH. Wow. Regardless of what I did in the NFL, no, they, remember, they, they remember the, the glory days at, U, at UH. That is cool. Yeah. Man. So. Let's talk about those glory days at UH. What would you say is your biggest highlight? Give me two big highlights from your career at UH. Um, so our senior year was a great one as a team. We 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 um, went. 
I think we only lost one game. But we uh, went to our first bowl game our senior year ever at, at the, in the university's history. Um, that was definitely the one. Another one was we, we had a 10-year losing streak to BYU, Brigham Young University. And that year, my senior year, we smashed them 56 to 14. Oh, my goodness. That, that was huge. So all my, my two older brothers that played ahead of me never beat BYU. They had all of them, every year they lost to BYU. Wow. And uh, my senior year, we, we broke that almost like curse because mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it felt like a curse. Yeah. Um, and, and I would think thirdly, um, yeah, so that, that game was huge. Um, but just there was, there was a lot. Of, my junior year, we ended up beating Iowa. They were nationally ranked. They were like in the top three in the nation. They came our, our opener. We, we upset them. Jason Elam was our kicker, the one with the Broncos that played with the Broncos. He kicked the winning field goal with like seconds on the clock. And so we so there was a lot of big teams that came through Hawaii uh, and underestimated us and we put wow. it on and we put it on them. Wow. <laughs> That's definitely amazing, man. The, I bet the local people enjoyed those. Oh games. yeah, yeah. So they still talk about it till today. <laughs> they'll they'll recite because they were all tailgating mm -hmm. before the game that when we came like Tailgaters, the game wasn't until 7. They would show up at noon and tailgate. So by the time the game started, they have been tailgating for six hours, <laughs> man, in the, in the Hawaii sun. But so oh, even though they had tents, the stadium parking lot was packed. So by the time we showed up in the buses to come in, they had, we had to have an escort because the, the stadium parking lot was packed with oh people. Oh, my goodness. So wow, that is, I I can't even understand that. That's no, it was like, it was it was like a smaller version of, of being in like a SEC school, like in Alabama, where it's like mm -hmm. that way, on a smaller scale. We didn't have a hundred seat stadium, but we have we had a fifty thousand, and it was packed. I'm sorry, not a hundred thousand. But that you know the SEC has those hundred those big yeah. huge stadiums. But, that is still that's wow that. Definitely... But literally, when we ran out of the locker room for mm -hmm. for uh, kickoff, the stadium would bounce. The, <laughs> Well, the people just jumping up and acting crazy, you could see the stadium bouncing. Oh, my goodness. That's <laughs> awesome. So all, I'm guessing all these big victories definitely attract a lot of scouts and a lot of attention from the NFL. Mm -hmm. And you being one of the key leaders definitely had a lot of eyes on you. Mm -hmm. How was that? Uh, talk, let's talk about drafted for a little bit, but also the preparation mm -hmm. to jump from college now to the big leagues. Yeah, so once I started getting all these letters, and once I went through, I think that the 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 thing that really shifted things for me is like, man, this is this can really happen. Was getting that scouting combine invite, getting that thing in the mail, and knowing that I was the only guy in our whole team that got one. Because um, those like so figure now, every single offensive lineman in the country, only about thirty guys go to this combine in the whole country, 30, 30. 30. Wow. You're talking all the SEC, all the Big 12, only 30 guys, offensive line. And that, that one event in every category, running, lifting, jumping, everything, I was either number one or number two. I was never number three. Wow. So that, after that couple days, I went from a, a Kind of an unknown to like uh, very well known where teams are wanting to fly me in. Teams were flying to Hawaii to have to have their online coach come work me out. That's, wow. That that all just kind of happened instantaneously mm -hmm. when they when when I went through that process. How so? Talk about that mindset when you jump from a local hero to now like a nas international. Yeah, it was. Um, luckily, I was grounded by two really, really good parents. Yeah. And they taught us from when we were young to um, how to treat people, how to uh, treat, especially elderly, uh, eld our elders with respect. And um, so I never had issues with that. Um, although, like I said earlier, we didn't have Jesus all, most of college, not to the very end. And it, if it wasn't for that, um, I think that in itself was the key that needed to happen because if that, that didn't happen, if we, we just went into the NFL with all the money, all the fame, all the mm -hmm. glory without Jesus, yeah, 
um, we wouldn't be married. Oh, because, definitely not. Because um, I can't think of, I only have like one guy or actually two that I remember that I played with that are, that is still married. Usually like right after, between a year and three years, uh, it's it's in the 90%. Wow. That's, guys, guys, they get divorced. Yeah. That, wow, that's, I can't even fathom that. Yeah. So you, you're grounded in Christ. All these teams are coming after you. How did you decide to go to the Chargers? So I don't decide. The draft decided. So we're here. We're in my, um, my, my wife's house that she grew up in. All her family, all my family. So the, they had a big family room with a TV. This was like the original big screen TVs that were like this thick from <laughs> front to back. Like the big, big fat ones, like, like 500 pounds. Oh, my goodness. So we're watching the draft uh, first day. And right as the telecast ended, the telecast ended at, I think, pick 58. I was the pick number 60. So at, they were just wrapping it up and saying goodbye. And they didn't have ESPN2 yet, so they couldn't go to ESPN2. Only had one ESPN channel. And so right as ESPN was uh, winding down the draft, the phone rings. And um, it's, it's a guy from the Chargers. And he just asked me, so how would you like to be a Charger? I said, I would love to be a Charger. Wow, it's probably relieved. And, and he basically, they already picked me. Mm -hmm. the, the pick was already in. He says, well, we just put our paper in. You're going to be our, our, I was our second pick, Junior C.L., and then me. And um, so we just picked you. And I said, serious, Chargers. And I let it out, and the whole room went nuts. <laughs> Like we had like 50 people in this in this family oh, room, <laughs> and, oh, wow. and so we're sitting there for hours watching, mm -hmm. you know, all the picks happen, mm -hmm. and so that was, you know, how do you how does it feel like if you're not the top 10, you're not the top 20? Like well, I wasn't the... expecting to go in the top 10, um, but there were teams that were talking about taking me in the late first round, mm -hmm. and I was like, if that happens, that's incredible, but. I, I didn't want to go into it with those expectations. I just wanted, to, I just, hey, whatever team um, wants me, that's who I'm going to, I'm going to give it up for. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, they make the decision, not me. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah. So you get drafted by the Chargers, you go to training camp and. Yeah, so before the training camp, there's mini camps. So all in all the mini camps did extremely well. So that's on in the early summer. Now, later summer is training camp. So a week before the training camp, they had announced that I was their starter at, at offensive at left left tackle. Okay. That it was my job to lose. So first day of training camp, I'm in the locker room getting suited up. I walk out, there's a bunch of media, I talk to them. They, you know, they just basically, hey, what does it feel like first day training camp? You're the starter at left tackle, a lot of pressure you know, what's going through your mind. And I, I talked to them and then I went down to the field. Uh, we got warmed up and we split up by positions, like a normal practice. And so we're kind of getting ready for our first interaction with the defense. So you go through like a 40 minute period just with the offensive line. All the positions are scattered throughout the field. Then they blow the horn, bop, bop. And that's the first time where now mm -hmm. the first team defense is gonna line up against the first team offense. And we're going to run probably 15 plays. It's all script. We're reading it off of a script. So we know what the plays are. They, they, um, and it was either the second or third play of that drill, very first drill live. So that, that play was a play where I'm at the left side of the line and I have to pull all the way down the line past the center on the opposite side of the line and come up and block the linebacker on the other side. I'm, so me, so I'm here, the guard is here, the center's here. So both me and the guard are doing this, pulling down. He's going to go kick out this defensive end on this side, and I'm going to lead up the hole, and the running back is literally right behind me. So the linebacker that I had my eye on, he kind of dashed inside because the, the running back kind of dipped inside. So that brought the linebacker, and I'm running full, full speed. Plant my foot turn and I feel something in my foot go pop break I could hear it in my ear and it's like um so I went down immediately they literally the trainers rushed to me 
and they basically just moved the drill down like 10 yards and kept going. Oh, wow. They don't stop practice. Yeah, they just they just keep going. Next guy up, right? What? So so the trainers are attending to me, and um, I I have a picture of me being escorted on a back of a of a cart up to the locker room, where they basically had put my my leg on a big cushion and packed it with ice, turned off the lights, and said, "We'll see you in an hour and a half." And I was all by myself, like. What? What exactly? What? What the heck is going on? And so a lot of emotions, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, a lot of, you can imagine what's running through my head. I couldn't put any weight on my foot. The doctors after practice come and look at me. They're pretty certain it's a torn um, uh, a ligament uh, in, in my foot. They run x-rays, sure enough, you could see the skeleton of my foot, the big toe and the little toe and all the other three toes, and you could see this flaky particle thing. That's where the tend a tendon attaches to the side of your arch had ruptured off the bone, like completely detached itself. And that tendon controls all the movement in your toes. So I'm like, oh, great. Uh, and so the next day, I have an MRI scheduled because they needed to find a special MRI to fit me because I was, you know, a big guy. So I had to wait. Uh, so the next day, I'm, I'm watching the afternoon practice, and um, I just get discouraged. Um, my foot was in a brace, big brace, boop. I'm on a golf cart because I couldn't walk, and I was just on crutches. So I, I took the cart back, and I headed back to my dorm room at, at the campus we were having training camp at, and I get on the rotary phone, because we had no cell phones. Yeah. I get on, we didn't have digital phones. Everything was turned rotary. I call my wife who was in our, in our apartment in, in San Diego, see how she was doing. And um, she, I was like this, man. I was a emotional wreck for, for 24 hours at least, maybe more. Uh, none of my teammates could even come up to me and talk to me because they, it was just, there was so much hype built up about me to have this injury happen and for because the, the the papers the very next day said go is gone basically saying my career was done wow that was the headline news of the of the san diego tribune was go is gone so they thought my career they thought my season was done but maybe even my career was done oh my goodness. that i would never be able to recover from something like this yeah but the mri was the was the kind of thing they were waiting on right because to that point, they had only taken an x-ray. Um, so I, I go back, I call my wife in that afternoon, and she's like all upbeat, sharing things that, that God was showing her. She was just scouring through scripture, and uh, she had started a prayer chain back in Hawaii, people praying for me to get healed, and she wants to share with me what God had put in her heart. And so I'm, I'm listening, as I said, yeah, by all means, I want to hear and so she she um, turns to Ephesians six, um, starting in verse ten, and I think it's through verse eighteen, where where Paul is basically talking about this, the putting on the armor, mm -hmm. and that it's a not a, not a battle of flesh and blood, blood, but of principalities and powers in high places, and then it goes through and lists all the armor. So as she's reading this, I'm imagine me, I'm laying down on a couch, my foot is kind of propped up, and I'm listening to her on this rotary phone, and I feel a, um, I feel a urgency or, I, it was the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. telling me to take the brace off. Okay. So I buckle it off, and I feel, I start to feel as she's like finishing that portion of scripture the first time, I ask her to read it a second time. And as she's doing it again, I start to feel like, Almost like when you're on a when you have a limb that goes like you lose circulation and it goes numb and then and then the blood flow comes back and you feel that tingling. Mm -hmm. I, f I felt something similar to that in my left leg as I'm taking off the thing, and I realize as she's reading it, I get prompted to move my foot. Which pr prior to putting that boot on, I couldn't move my foot any anything not even the slightest 
without feeling like it was somebody just jabbing a mm -hmm. sharp object into it. I start moving my foot around with no pain. Like I'm doing like flexing my toes. And then by that time I'm standing up and she has no idea what's going on. She's still reading the verse, the verses to me. I ask her to read it a third time. By that time I'm standing up, walking around my dorm room and I just start weeping, like heaving. Wow. Knowing that what was happening. And she goes, are you okay? What's wrong? And I share with her what, what, what was taking place. And so we just had a uh, amazing time of Thanksgiving. And so a few hours later, the trainer picks me up, takes me to the hospital for the MRI. I get put in, you know, get set for the MRI. They wheel, wheel me into the big tube. I don't know if you ever had an MRI, but it's a big tube. Mm -hmm. And you, you're basically like this and you can't really move at all. And uh, they put some headset headset on me with some music and for 55 minutes in that MRI machine the enemy was taunting and just just speaking lies into my brain uh lies like you didn't get healed it's you you believe you got healed you didn't get healed you're going back to Hawaii and you're gonna be a freaking security guard <laughs> just stupid <laughs> stuff right and so finally I just started getting mad and I just being a, still a kind of a baby, babe in Christ, I knew some scriptures by heart, by memory. Greater is he than is, that is in me than he that is in the world, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So for a big chunk of that 55 minutes, I'm literally yelling those scriptures in the tube, in the MRI tube. Um, this trainer picks me up when I'm done. I sleep like a baby that night in, in anticipation for what's going to happen come out of the MRI the next morning. So I go to the training room the next morning. Uh, the trainer, the head trainer, who happened to be a, a local Hawaii guy, um, he sees me coming in. He weighs me to the back. And the first thing out of his mouth is kind of talking our little Hawaiian little slang. Brah, I don't know what happened from yesterday, but your MRI is completely clean. They can't find anything wrong with your foot. Wow. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jesus. So, yeah, thank you, Jesus. So I was just like the loudest I could scream. I was like, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so, wow. so God healed me on the spot. Mm -hmm. um, I went and played my whole rookie year. Yeah. And to make things, I think God has an amazing sense of humor. He allowed me to be, become a consensus all-rookie. So every, every, like, um, all the big publications have their own all-rookie team. Mm -hmm. I made every single one of them Man. as a rookie. Um, it was just, I think God allowed my wife and I both to walk mm -hmm. through this, yeah. this, this really dark, difficult time, mm -hmm. knowing that we we're going to have to rely on him. We we're going to have to depend on him. We we're going to have to cry out to him yeah. to deliver us from that, to... It was, it was like almost like the Egyptians when they crossed over the river, God had them go back and grab stones out of the middle of the river mm -hmm. and build an altar as a remembrance so they could, they could testify that to future generations. That was yeah. kind of like our remembrance where we could always go back years later when, when life happens wow. and difficult times come to, to just say between her and I, remember when. Yeah, because that would definitely help your faith. Just... Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. Go through the roof. Yeah. So this, I mean, that's the best way to start a career. If you had, like, this would probably be the hardest one because you played for, I believe, 13 years. No, I wish. Is it eight years? <laughs> eight years. Okay, good. I was thinking about Shannon Sharp. Uh, yeah. If you had to, how would you best summarize your NFL career and, let's say, three highlights from your career? Um, I would say... Uh, which, which came out of a difficult time. So, so my f first year was phenomenal. Al although you know we had that injury and I got healed, but leading up to my second year, I ended up losing my dad. Uh, he died like a week prior to my second training camp. It was sudden. He had a massive heart attack at home. I spoke to him that night. Almost, almost didn't. Almost, I almost because it was late at night. My wife was talking to my sister, trying to um, 
we just had our second child, just bought our child home from the hospital. I was still working out really hard. So I was, they were talking like at nine at night for in San Diego time. I was tired. My dad wanted to talk to me. I said, no, I'll just call him tomorrow. Don't, don't, I don't want to talk to him right now. He ends up dying like three hours later. So we end up talking for like an hour and a half, my dad and I. Man. He, he, we literally have this hour and a half conversation all about football, yeah. all about what's going on with the charges, who's holding out, all this stuff. And right before we hung up, he, he says, like he always did, hey, so proud of you. I'll call you um, next week before you report to camp. And then he told me to take care of our, that little girl, meaning our daughter, Allie, who's now 34, no, 31. And, um, and so I said, yeah, of course. Um, so I said, we said goodbye. I, I'm fast asleep. Three hours later, I get a call from my, my, old, my older brother. Dad died, gone. And uh, that was rough. Yeah. So we had to, you know, bury. I'm getting to your question, but kind of want to set the stage. So we go home, have the services. Then I immediately have to come back to San Diego. Training camp was already started. The team was cool. They let me miss the first day or two because of the services and all that. And for um, f every day for like a couple weeks in camp, I would have dreams about my dad, like childhood dreams, like growing up as a little boy. And just subconsciously, obviously, it's in there because I'm dreaming about it, right? But God was allowing me to have these dreams. And through that, uh, God showed me, this was, this uh, to get to your point was, so out of all that, because I had to that point, even having been saved already, I was still playing, not even realizing it, for the, to glorify my earthly dad, to make him happy, to make him proud, to make him give me the thumbs up, because I, 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 would, I would yearn for that. I would always look to see where he was, and if I got the fist or the thumbs up, man, I was, I was good. I don't care how I graded out in the game. As long, long as dad felt that I was doing what, it, you know, mm -hmm. to his standard aid set to me as a young boy, I was good. And God convicted me of that. Wow. That I needed to repent of that bit. That, that, that is only reserved for him. Wow. So I did. And from that point on, my whole career changed mm -hmm. in that. I was playing for the audience of one. I never did that before. I was praying for I was praying for one, but the, it was the wrong one. Yes, yes. You know, everybody. So, so that was a big revelation for me in my career is is coming to that, mm -hmm. and through these dreams I was having, and God was showing me uh, that that was uh, that was life changing and career changing for me. Mm -hmm. So every time I stepped on the field, yeah, it was after that point, mm -hmm. Lord. You gave me this body to play this game. You gave me this mind. You equipped me with these skills to play. I give it all back to you. Man. So it was like a worship time on the field. Even though mm -hmm. I'm going against another 300-pound man and he's trying to mm -hmm. make me look bad on national TV, mm -hmm. I'm doing. But it's, it's a job. Yeah. But I'm doing it for the King of Kings. Yeah. And that changed my whole kind of paradigm. So that will probably be the, the by number. far the biggest. That was the number one thing mm -hmm. that. And um, I just, you know, God was faithful in putting me with some good men early on in my career that kind of, because again, we got saved right before the draft yeah. uh, to mentor me in the NFL, in the locker room. Like, what is it like to be a, a man of God in the locker room? Hardest place, I think, in, one of the, in the world to be a godly man is in the locker room. Yes. Because you, you're on guys that, that are just acting like fools. Yes. And they have all the money, they have all the fame, and to differentiate yourself, and be, you're, you're, you want to love on those guys, but you got to be separate because when they're going to the strip clubs and they're doing all this stuff after practice and doing all this craziness, mm -hmm. you got to draw the line, man. Yes, you do. And they will tease you and maybe kind of just you know make fun of you, but guarantee at some point in that season when things are tough, you're the one they're going to come coming to. Mm -hmm. Amen. Can you pray for me? I'm going through this and that. Yeah. And so. Um, wow, that is awesome. But 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 it's a it's a temptation that is mm -hmm. so in front of your face that mm -hmm. you have to set boundaries. Yeah. 
Otherwise, you can get swept up into it like really quick. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can imagine that. Because you yeah. figure every every home game, there's eight home eight away games, eight home games. Every hotel lobby that you walk into, mm -hmm. there's gorgeous women waiting. Just they just there just to hook try to hook up with a player. Wow. And you, you, you we're just everywhere. walking to get our key to get to our room, mm -hmm. and they're all like you can see them. Yeah. And, wow. you know, you could see some players going over there and, 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 you know, having a conversation with them. That's what I'm saying, man. You have, you, you have, okay. Luckily, I had strong brothers who were rooted in their faith early on, like my rookie year, mm -hmm. who I never had to deal with any of it because I had, he taught me how to, um, to live a solid Christian life mm -hmm. in the NFL. Yeah. So, I mean, that's obviously a huge victory. What what other victories would you say on the field successes that you had as a player? Um, wow, yeah, I blocked for some. I blocked for some really good players. So my my uh, second team was the Rams. So Jerome Bettis is uh, blocked for him for a couple of years. His first couple of years in the league when he made All Rookie, mm -hmm. and he made the Pro Bowl as a rookie. Um, you, you know, just so never played in the Super Bowl. Got close to making it to the Pro Bowl that year, actually. Had a good year in 93. But um, hmm. um, I was a middle-of-the-road guy. Yeah. Um, just a, you, We would call ourselves blue-collar guys in the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, back then, I was making, you know, at the height of my career, making a million, little over a million a year. That was big money back then. Now, yeah, not if I'm much. that same guy now playing, I'm making six a year. Probably. Because that's how big the NFL has gotten from yeah. From my days till now, mm -hmm. but um, okay. it, it it was it was an awesome ride and mm -hmm. um, a very good ride. So I will, as we wrap up here, I want to touch on this question, which I think a lot of guys struggle with this, especially guys who play a high level sport yeah. in the time any sport or any activity that has a timetable. Yep. How how did you deal with the reality? Okay, I'm coming to the end of my career. This is what I've wanted to do for a long time, and I've done it. But I'm I'm only at thirty in my thirties at this point. Yeah. How then did what was, how did you help yourself transition to this new Yeah, it's never easy. Um some guys really go off the cliff. Yeah. Uh luckily I had a, a, a solid wife who was mm -hmm. so rooted in her faith. Um that's usually when things the wheels on the wagon come off in a marriage, when when players go through all that and the money stops, the hundred thousand dollar weekly checks stop. And she can't go do all this anymore. And, you know, you know, it just it just that whole lifestyle is it's a fake lifestyle, but it is it is what it is mm -hmm. when you're in it. And um, the you get for me and I think most players, too, there's nothing on the outside that can duplicate the the adrenaline rush you get when you come out of, of a stadium locker room and you run into a stadium full of fans. You, you get this rush. You get addicted to it. You get addicted weekly to that rush of running into a stadium and singing the national anthem and putting your putting your your male parts on the line to uh, for your team and for your family and everything, right? Because mm -hmm. you're playing against a, a really good player. Yes. Now I played against all of them: Reggie White, Derek Thomas, pro, Hall of Fame guys. And uh, every week you got a guy that can humiliate you if you're not ready, if you're not prepared. So the transition was, um, I didn't know what to do for a couple of years, so I didn't do anything. I, um, I started working with the firm that represented me, kind of mentoring their players, but um, I was still trying to figure out, I didn't have a, I didn't have a plan B mm -hmm. while I was playing. Yeah. And, and that, that I wish I did, it would have made it a smoother transition. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you transition to become an agent and then you do that for a little while, and then you become. A well, I actually did the agent thing for seventeen years. Oh, seventeen years. Yeah, yeah. So I did it you for did seventeen for a very long years. Time then. Mm -hmm. And then midway through it, uh, the industry was was running in a direction that was really crazy with upfront money that you had to pay players mm -hmm. to get them to sign with you. So yeah. I transitioned out of it, whereby I was just representing the half a dozen guys that already had negotiated contracts and. Mm -hmm. ready were my guys I was just waiting for them to yeah. retire mm -hmm. so that that lasted another that's why I was a, a licensed agent all that time 
half of the time I wasn't recruiting new guys. I was I'd already transitioned to what I'm doing now. Yeah. I was just servicing the guys I already had for okay. about seven years. Okay. They were already established veteran guys paying me a great fee mm -hmm. and I was just kind of riding them out until they were done. I mean, and yeah. I had one guy that played sixteen years. So I was waiting for one guy to get <laughs> to to finally retire that I got out. Wow. So now like looking back, because you've had you've lived a life that a lot of people would I mean, dream about living. Well, how would you? This is probably gonna be the hardest question because I mean that's like fifty-four years. Yeah. How would you summarize your life looking back? Um, nothing short of God's faithfulness. Um, even when I explained my my idiot years as a high schooler, there were times where I don't know how I got home. I was so wasted, drunk. Wow. And I don't know how I got home. Mm -hmm. He saw me through that idiot part of my life. And then he used me in a great way while I was in the NFL. We would do multiple outreaches and great mm -hmm. things yeah. uh, with every team that I was with. I was always plugged in. I was either um, hosting the, the, the Bible studies at our house for the teams that we were with. Did that for most of the years we played. So that group of guys that were on those all those different teams, mm -hmm. I still stay in contact with till today. Wow. Um, and then post NFL, yeah, it's just having been a former NFL player, um, people are interested in, in finding out. You know, you know, they look you up on Google and say, "Hey, I read all this about you." <laughs> and um, so, yeah, it was to to answer that question though, it's, it's God's faithfulness. Without mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um none of yeah. it none of it none of it happens that's awesome man thank you thank you for, yep. for coming to the show and just sharing your story and this is the first one in a while so i'm glad it's with you all right i got my rust <laughs> off now i think i'm ready to get going but all honestly, right yes. i'm very grateful okay you got it man thank you everyone for watching the show remember we all have a story what's your story goodbye